Thank you for the introduction. So yes, I would like to echo um, Val's thank you um, to the Tate, to the team here, and also to the Fast Forward team. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak. I'm afraid I don't want to hit a wrong button. Okay. <laughs> so before um, I get into the heart of my discussion today, I would like to take a few minutes and establish some context for both the institution in which I work and the cultural worker, Joe Spence. The Ryerson Image Center at Ryerson University, which I will now refer to as the RIC, in Toronto, Canada, opened its doors in 2012. While the seat of the collection can be traced back to 1968, it is a new institution still in its formative years. This has afforded the tremendous opportunity of acquiring material that is rare in its breadth and this has allowed the RIC to begin shaping a collection that is distinct. Among its holdings, the Joe Spence archive came in three accruals. The first in 2010, the second in 2011, and the third in 2014. It is one of a small number of archive groups that represent the institution's commitment to collecting in depth the work of influential 20th century female photographers. It is unique in its scale and importance, and it consists of over 250 boxes of material holding Spence's personal diaries and journals, personal and professional correspondence, teaching materials, and over 100 exhibition photographs and digital surrogates along with hundreds of personal negatives and snapshots. Joe Spence was a British, London-based photographer, as well as a community activist, a feminist, educator, and artistic collaborator. Unhappy with the limits of the documentary mode to effect real social change, Spence employed strategies of self-portraiture and performance in order to communicate ideas around class struggle and gendered subjectivity in her photographs. Together with Terry Dennett, her earliest collaborator, she co-founded Photography Workshop in 1974, an alternative archive, research hub, and resource center that, quote, grew out of our dissatisfaction with current trends in British photography and our desire to contribute, contribute towards social change, unquote. It was a place where interested individuals could turn for practical help in setting up darkrooms and participate in workshops and courses on photography and photographic education. In 1976, Photography Workshop shop joined forces with the Half Moon Theatre Company, a small group of performers using an abandoned synagogue in the London borough of Tower Hamlets to stage their political plays. Thus, the Half Moon Photography Workshop was born, and for the next year and a half, through exhibitions, workshops, and her involvement on the editorial board of the workshop's seminal publication, camera work, Spence facilitated the exchange of ideas between photographers and explored the, explored the many motivations for taking pictures and the implications of their ultimate use. At the time, the main question for Half Moon Photography Workshop was not whether photography was art or not, but rather who photography was or could be for. Following Spence's death in 1992, Dennett managed the repository of each of their life's work as well as Spence's collaborative projects and the work they'd created together. The Joe Spence Memorial Archive was founded and remained in Dennett's apartment for 20 years, the same council flat that he and Spence used as Photography Workshop headquarters in 1974. It is important to note, however, that various other components of the Joe Spence Memorial Archive were dispersed elsewhere and Dennett no longer administers the remainder of the material he presided over for two decades. Today, in fact, you'll find various vintage components of the Joe Spence Memorial Archive splintered into many holdings, some publicly accessible, others not. Charged as I am with organizing the Rick's Joe, Sp uh, the Joe Spence Archive, this poses a number of questions regarding how to make intellectual and physical sense of the material. Are traditional archival best practices such as respect de fond or the idea of original order useful in this context? How do I begin to make sense of an archive that was collaboratively shaped and maintained in flux? And as recently as the aforementioned dispersal occurred, how do I give shape to what is only part of a still moving archive? As already mentioned, Spence worked collaboratively with groups as well as with individuals. Singular authorship was always secondary in her mind to a primary focus on interrogating photographic images, 
how they functioned in the public and private sphere, and ultimately, how they worked to subjugate individuals based on gender and class power relations. The combination of text and photographs, common to much of her work, sought to critique implicit class and gender-based power politics in both public and private imagery. Dennett's interests were primarily rooted in the activities of the British Workers' Film and Photo League of the 1930s. In his essay, England, the Workers' Film and Photo League, published in Photography Workshop's first annual, Photography Politics I, Dennett describes the discovery of the League's London archive. Tellingly, he highlights a section of the League's manifesto emphasizing the wide distribution of news photographs domestically and abroad. He further mentions Photography Workshop's plan to, pre to, to prepare a master set of negatives and prints of League documents and surviving photographs for their archive. He subsequently collaborated on two panel exhibitions that resulted from this newly discovered material. Both exhibitions, in their entirety or in sections, were available for hire and were a manifestation of Dennett's interest in the League's theoretical underpinnings of photography as leftist political pedagogy. This suggests three things. First, reaching a wide popular audience was a priority for Photography Workshop. Second, copies as photographic reproductions were seen as viable resource material in an archive. And third, exhibitions were not fixed or static. As photography historian and theorist Siona Wilson has noted, Dennett's interest in the British Workers' Film and Photo League served as a model for, quote, the organization of Photography Workshop, and I would argue the Joe Spence Memorial Archive, as a kind of dispersed counter-institution, unquote. Spence and Dennett's 1982 project, Remodeling Photo History, and its many iterations illustrate this further. Insofar as we know this project, one of Spence's best known projects, originally consisted of a single photograph titled The Highest Products of Capitalism after John Hartfield, and seven panels with all but the last comprised of photographic diptychs. The last panel pairs a photograph with a poem by German Marxist playwright and poet Bertolt Brecht. Like many of Photography Workshop's exhibitions, remodeling photo history is comprised of photographs and text laminated to a support. Simply hung using push pins, panel exhibitions such as these were common as they were cheap to make, easily traveled, and loaned for a nominal fee. Remodeling photo history first appeared in 1982 in the exhibition, 10 Contemporary British Photographers at Creative Photography Gallery at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States from February 2nd to March 19th. And in the May-June issue of, Brit of the British Film Institute Screen Magazine. Inspired by Breck's work, the writings of Brazilian theater director Augusto Boll, the staged photographs of the 19th century photographer F. Holland Day, and the studio-based tableau photography of the Canadian duo Carol Conde and Carl Beveridge, Spence and Dennett attempted to disrupt and complicate established genres of photography concerning representations of the female body. In a 2010 interview conducted by Ryerson University professor Vid Ingelvix and photo historian David Harris, Dennett refers to remodeling photo history's inclusion in the 1982 MIT exhibition, recalling that it was mounted on blackboard with every diptych individually titled, like the examples seen here, from a version he sold in 2010 to the Reina Sofia National Museum of Art in Spain, in Madrid, Spain. Dennett also mentions a second version made specifically for use in workshops and delivering lectures. The written article accompanying the reproduction of the work in Screen Magazine authored by Dennett and Spence states, quote, we both felt that it could have another life as a short, polemical, tongue-in-cheek teaching work for photographic and art courses and workshops in this country. To this end, a second set of laminated prints are now available for loan or hire. So far, these have been used on several very different occasions and have always provoked lively and productive discussions between students and teachers, unquote. 
Unlike the exhibition version, Dennett recalls that this teaching version had a red background and is in fact the one seen here, sold to the Barcelona Museum of Contemporary Art in Spain in 2006. In, in her 1986 autobiography, Putting Myself in the Picture, Spence in part reproduces the work with swapped diptych pairings, new titles, additional photographs, and new sequencing. Remodeling photo history was never finally fixed in form or content. A January 2010 email from Dennett to the RIC addressing the, addressing the donation of the archive explicitly states that the RIC would receive unmounted, quote, unmounted non-exhibition prints of this series plus digital files, unquote. Our version of remodeling photo history therefore includes 23 high resolution digital scans, one 40 by 60 inch chromogenic print, 31 gelatin silver and digital prints, and one gelatin silver contact sheet. It is important to note that the Joe Spence Memorial Archive was a private entity maintained by Dennett in his home, and the impetus behind its founding stemmed from the same ideologies embodied by Photography Workshop, to pass information onto others and make it possible for interested individuals to realize their political and personal potential. For Dennett, this meant an ongoing struggle to organize the archive in order to provide access to a myriad of interested individuals all with very little, if any, compensation. Dennett is now in his late 70s, and his apartment at 152 Upper Street is in a state of disrepair. Richard Saltoon, the London-based gallery owner and dealer, who now represents the Joe Spence estate, is in the process of cataloging the remaining material and featured some of her collaborative work at his booth during Freeze London in October 2014, presumably for sale. Other parts of the archive also surfaced at the Association of Independent Photo Art Dealers Fair in New York City earlier this year. The Joe Spence Memorial Archive was established as an extension of photography workshop. For Dennett, this meant reproducing original works and placing multiple copies and various versions of projects, whether as prints or digital files, in a number of different collections, both in Europe and abroad. In Dennett's view, this would ensure that the legacy of the workshop would survive. Signing over the Joe Spence estate to Saltoon also solved many of Dennett's problems. Remaining elements of the archive moved to a more secure location. And Spence's work continues to circulate, generating new interest amongst viewers. However, the difference in character between Dennett's archive and Saltoon's business cannot be overstated. The former's was rooted in praxis and by a deeply engaged critical socialist agenda, while the latter deals in the world of single artists additioned or one-of-a-kind objects for sale. Spence, in a final letter to Dennett before she died, actually outlined the conditions for use of her work. Quote, since we now exhibit most of our work outside England, I want you to carry on the present shows, i.e., clear up all the outstanding non-UK projects as a first task. You should, of course, continue to do stuff in England, but only where it is useful for students and promotes the debates that we have been trying to raise. I don't want to end up as a quote-unquote art gallery hack. My work will be sterilized if it is shown out of context. So little treasure, keep it polemical and socially useful, unquote. However, she also states, quote, don't let that stop you from flogging the odd bit of quote-unquote fine art to raise money for the collection, unquote. The Joe Spence Memorial Archive no longer exists as it once did. The Rick's Joe Spence Archive and the dispersal of the Joe Spence Memorial Archive reflects a certain path, one caught up in a matrix of art world exhibition value and commodity exchange on the one hand and photography as a tool for political and social change on the other. It embodies in its form and content the continuation of a project, one influenced by the British Workers' Film and Photo League of the 1930s and shaped by the socio-political cultural climate of London in the 1970s and 1980s, and by the contradictory forces of the art market and the legacy of photography as leftist political pedagogy. The relatively recent and far-reaching dispersal of Dennett's archive across the public and private sector 
is part of an already existing trajectory with a history, one that sought a critique from within the ranks. In a footnote in Siona Wilson's book, Art, Labor, Sex, Politics, she cites a conversation with Dennett where he indicates shifting to the proper use of the single name, Joe Spence, for her collaborative work in an art world context. It is vital, in my view, that this information be pulled from the proverbial footnote to the fore in organizing the Rick's archive. The Rick's version of remodeling photo history, as a case in point, carries with it a message, a dialectical critique created against the backdrop of photography workshop, its teaching activities, and its counter archive. It is a message Dennett kept, reproduced, exhibited, and disseminated from the Joe Spence Memorial Archive for almost 20 years and hoped would endure in the public domain for perpetuity. Managing the Rick's Joe Spence Archive has therefore meant treating reproductions of works the same as we would their vintage counterparts. It means applying strategies to digital surrogates of photographs and artworks, installation documentation, and digitally reproduced documents that align with the most current standards of digital preservation. Going forward, it means reaching out to, for example, the History and Theory of Photography Research Center at Birkbeck University, who now hold the Joe Spence Memorial Library, the Tate, who hold photographs and related ephemera from the archive, the Museum of Contemporary Art Barcelona, and Rina Sofia Museum of National Art in Madrid, who both hold a number of important photography workshop panel exhibitions in their collections. It means creating meaningful dialogue with Terry Dennett and other collaborators that Spence worked with, namely Rosie Martin, and surviving members of the 1970s collectives, the Hackney Flashers and the Polly Snappers. Appropriate stewardship of our holdings, in effect, means being the connective tissue between the scattered elements of the Joe Spence Memorial Archives material and the people who made it. To ensure Spence's work is recognized and recorded and ultimately maintains a foothold within histories of cultural production and broader histories of photography, we must engage with its plural context, both past and present. Thank you.